day today. Today is Hernia Talk Tuesday. Welcome to everyone joining us for our weekly Q question and answer session. As you know, my name is Dr. Sharin Tofai. I'm your host every week here. Uh, we are currently on Zoom as well as simulcast on Facebook Live. You can follow me on, at, on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. On Facebook, many of you are uh, with me on my homepage at Dr. Tofai. Once we're done, I'll make sure that this is posted on my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm very excited because today we have a guest panelist from Germany, Professor Andreas Koch. We can't call him doctor because in the US is doctor and Europe is professor. Professor Andreas Koch is a uh, hernia surgery specialist. He is most well known for his work with professional athletes. As you know, a lot of great German athletes, especially soccer players. Um, so we'll discuss some of that. And he is also very good at tissue based hernia repairs. And uh, like me, uh, treats a lot of women with hernias and hernia related complications. You can follow him at Twitter at Coke Kotfuss, which I believe is, um, that's your practice, right? Hi, Professor Koch. Hello, Sharin. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here online with you and uh, with all your followers from Hernia Talk. And I'm looking forward to uh, our discussion about hernia complications, pure tissue repairs, and uh, the problems of the athletes and uh, in the most uh, or many athletes, uh, not even surgery is the only thing we have. Uh, there are a lot of conservative treatments we can do as well. So uh, that's a very special part, uh, a bit out of hernia surgery. Yes, and you're very good at it. So um, Dr. Koch is uh, practiced in Germany. And where is your actual practice in Cologne or outside of Cologne? No, no, I'm close to Berlin. Oh, I'm close to Berlin. Berlin. Um, it's a 100,000 uh, inhabitants city between Berlin and Dresden in the middle. Yeah, in the former East Germany. Former East Germany. So last, was it last? No, two years ago, uh, I was in Hamburg for the European Hernia Society. I got to go to Berlin. I'd never been to Germany before. It's now officially my favorite country. It used to be France. But Germany is really, really amazing. Hamburg was fantastic. And I got to visit Berlin as well. Um, and many don't know, but Germany is one of the, one of the key countries uh, historically in developing hernias and hernia related advancements. And that continues to be true. There's a lot of great specialists and coming out of uh, Germany and German hernia society is very strong and um, has its own kind of uh, uh, leaders within it. Dr. Cook for sure is one of them. So thank you for, for coming and joining me. Um, I know that there's been uh, in, a discussion about you on herniatalk.com because you're one of few surgeons in uh, Europe that does regularly offer a tissue-based ingual hernia pair. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and we already have tons of people on uh, Facebook as well logging in. Uh, to, to ask you some questions. So maybe we can start on the sports hernia side and then we can go to the tissue or women's hernia side. Is that okay with you? Yeah, okay, fine. How did you get involved with this? Because sports hernias are something that general surgeons aren't really trained in doing in their residency. Yeah, um, I'm, I come uh, or myself, I'm coming from sports, from winter sports, I made bobsleigh as a pilot for many oh, years at the professional okay. level. And uh, from that side, uh, I had a lot of interest in sports medicine. And uh, we have a very famous soccer team here yes. uh, in, in my hometown. We are playing six years in the Bundesliga. Now we have uh, strange times. We are going down uh, to the fourth league. It's uh -huh. um, so uh, amazing for us, but uh, when we are playing in the first league, uh, I was the uh, the team doctor of this uh, soccer team, and one of our most famous players here was Greg Berhalter, uh, who is now the head coach of the U.S. national team. Oh, uh, really? 
as the national soccer team and he Fantastic. was the captain of our team when we are playing in the Bundesliga. And so, um, and from my work with a lot of professional football players, uh, there was a growing interest uh, from hernia surgery to groins mm. of uh, professional athletes. And uh, we see that many times in uh, soccer players and hockey players as well. Yeah. And uh, Greg Berhalter, when he was a national player for the United States, he got an operation at uh, Will Myers in Philadelphia. Yes. And uh, he connected me with uh, Bill Myers uh, so that I got in 2005 the opportunity to visit him in Philadelphia. And I have learned a lot of things there when I visit Myers. And uh, I've introduced his technique here in Europe. And I do his technique in uh, selected cases of soccer players. Yeah. And I can. Uh, for all the people which are online now, I, I can show a wonderful book by Will Myers. Yeah. And, uh, Introducing the core. Uh, when you are interested in this topic, here it's a, I think it's a 400 pages book, and everything is written. You have to know about uh, the core of uh, high performance athletes. Yeah, it's very interesting. If somebody is interested in it's very interesting to read this book. Yeah. That's great. You're right. So usually the typical sports injuries in the groin occur in soccer or football, what you, what you call football, we call soccer, um, hockey, right? Maybe yes. basketball a little bit. Yeah, but not maybe so a little bit of tennis, but mostly it's the hockey and soccer players. Yes. Um, so what, what I struggle with sometimes is people come to me that are 70 years old or just a regular housewife and they've been told they have a sports <laughs> sports hernia. Is that even possible? Uh, in, in, in my opinion, and uh, when we are talking about that, we are, we are on the bridge between uh, hernia surgery and uh, yes. uh, treating pain because... Yes. Uh, uh, when we have a non-high performance athlete who comes right. to us with uh, pain, with pain in the groin, and there is no incarceration of a hernia, then we have to search for the reason of the pain. And uh, we know from the literature that especially women, mm -hmm. uh, women uh, with small hernias have a high level high preoperative level of pain yes and they got an operation and they have the same level of pain postoperatively so that means we found a hernia we fixed the hernia but we doesn't solve the problem mm -hmm. and, uh, in my opinion in these cases which are coming coming with pain and they say yeah i have a kind of a sports hernia the first question should be um uh, you're really really doing sports on a high level yeah and if not, uh, we have to search, what's your problem? We have to uh, find the right diagnosis for, for your pain. The hernia is not the diagnosis uh, which causes your pain. Correct. And that's a <clears throat> different in high performance athletes when uh, they got a weakness in the so-called Hesselbach triangle mm -hmm. and get a compression of the ilioinguinal and especially the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve. Then they got a compression when they do their sports on a high level. And this compression of the nerve uh, could cause pain, which is going to the inside of the upper leg and yes. to the outside of the vagina or outside of the scrotum, mm -hmm. yeah, the lateral side of the uh, scrotum. And these are the typical symptoms. And sometimes uh, high performance athletes are coming and say, yeah, I have uh, typically uh, sports groin. And when you examine them, uh, they have problems at the adductors. They have problems on the symphysis, but not really groin pain. 
And uh, these are the cases where we, we have to talk about core stability. Mm -hmm. And uh, these patients or these athletes are getting in the first step a core stability program and uh, sometimes combined with injections uh, on the adductors or on the symphysis or around the pubic bone. And uh, this combination of injections, uh, sometimes combined with shock waves and the core stability, uh, you can treat more than 60% of these athletes. Because uh, what we have learned is, especially in hockey and uh, in soccer players, they uh, uh, trained uh, not really good in the whole core. Yeah, yes. They have uh, very strong rectus muscles. They have uh, very uh, strong adductors. And they have no back muscles. Yeah, and uh, so you you have to train them. And there's an interesting paper from uh, from Australia uh, from uh, Australian football. And they picked up one team. Uh, and they gave one team in, uh, in the professional league a core stability program, and mm -hmm. they did it twice a week. And uh, in that team, they have a decreased, more than 90% decreased rate of injuries, uh, which are called sports hernia or groin pain or something oh. like that. Yeah? yeah. And the etiology of the real groin pain is that you get a mild rupture in the Hesselbach triangle and then a weakness in the floor, in the inguinal floor. It's not a typical hernia, but with ultrasound uh, or with an MRI with Valsalva, you can see how the bulge comes up. And these cases you, you are able to treat with an operation. Yeah. And all the other cases, you need three to six months of course stability. And then around 70% of, uh, of the athletes are completely free of pain. And then you have another 30% where, uh, where you are not able to treat them uh, with, uh, with this conservative treatment. But then you have to do a very complex surgery. This is the Myers repair, where you uh, replace the lateral third of, uh, uh, of the rectus muscle down to the Cooper's ligament, uh, mm -hmm. where you uh, stabilize the floor and sometimes uh, a release of the uh, insertion of the adductors and sometimes a release of uh, uh, of the sartorius muscle on the iliac spine anterior. Oh, iliac wow. Spine. Yeah, that's pretty extensive. That's, that's uh, extensive surgery and uh, only for real selected cases. And uh, to find out who is able to profit from this extensive surgery, you need a lot of experience. To... So what's important is to understand then what is the core? So the core is not just your abs or what we call abs. It's your rectus muscles and all the abdominal muscles in the front. It's also your back muscles in the yep. back and your side muscles in the flank. It's yep. also your pelvic floor as yep. the bottom. And it's also your diaphragm up top. So all of that is part of your core. And you're right. Like hockey players have enormous thighs, for example, um, an enormous rectus, but it's all a pulley. It's like a system where if one is weaker than the other, that's where injuries occur. And so that's very interesting that they're, they are in fact doing a lot of core based. That's why, you know, athletes still do like yoga and Pilates because those are very core based activities. They don't only have to do weightlifting <laughs> at the gym or, or running. And then uh, they need to do a lot of these other girly, girly stuff. And the typical sign is the so-called C sign. When you go to the to the stand up, you go to the hip and you made a C yes. here. And when yes. the pain in the C, 
then yes. that's the first step to see uh, to, to see the road to the hip impingement. Yeah. Yes. And we, we have to know about uh, these hip impingements, and uh, we have a lot of athletes, especially the goalies in uh, uh, in hockey, uh, when they met the butterfly. Mm. And mm -hmm. uh, most of the goalies have these uh, cam or pincer impingements on the hip. And you, you need a very experienced um, orthopedic surgeon who, yes. who is able to deal with these hip impingements. And many, many athletes are coming and say, yeah, I have a sports groin. No, they have a hip impingement. Yes, we had an orthopedic hip specialist on Hernia Talk Live maybe two or three months ago, Dr. Jason Snibby. And uh, yeah, I always teach my residents the C sign. You know, when they, they do make a C and they push, put it around their hip, uh, every time a patient describes that, the first thing you have to look for is a hip problem. And there's a lot of hip pain and issues that present with groin pain. And that's why it's, it's, it's a complicated area. But what you're telling me, which is very good, and I would like our audience to know, is sports hernias are usually a strain or an injury or an entrapment of a nerve because of the strain of the muscle, but it's often at least 70% not surgical. Yeah. Whereas a hernia, if it has pain, is 100% surgical. Yeah. So when you say not surgical, you offer them core stability, physical therapy, I assume. And then what else do you also do or uh, recommend? I do, I do injections, uh, glucose injections, and uh, sometimes uh, with corticosteroids and local anesthetics mm -hmm. and uh, some homeopathic things like Traumil. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I do, uh, vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is very helpful in many cases. High dose vitamin D for three to four weeks. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. What about PRP? Do you do PRP injections, the plasma rich protein? Uh, in very rare cases, mm -hmm. uh, very rare cases when they have a real symphysitis, then sometimes I do that. Yeah but only in these selected cases. And the muscles we're talking about, one is the rectus muscle. So rectus muscle is like the six pack, we call it the six pack. So the two rectus muscles that come down, they, they insert on the pubic bone. And so what happens? They contract a very strong rectus muscle and it pulls away from the bone. Is that right? Yeah, uh, it's interest, uh, there is an interesting description, the papers of uh, Will Myers, uh, because uh, he said uh, the symphysis in a high performance athlete is like a joint mm -hmm. with all the muscles around and uh, the symphysis in young uh, people is flexible and it works like a joint. And uh, when, when the pelvis is not stabilized by the core muscles completely, mm -hmm. then you, you will have a lot of movement in, uh, in the symph uh, symphysis. And that's the reason why you get a symphysitis. And uh, wow. when, the, when uh, you have on top of the pubic bone, the rectus muscles, which are very strong, and then the adductors, which are very strong. And especially in the soccer players or in the hockey players, there's a high load on the symphysis. And that's the reason why you get these uh, symphysitis and uh, all these problems there. Myers is talking about the pubic joint. Yes, very interesting. So besides the rectus muscle, you mentioned the adductor muscles. The adductor muscle is a thigh muscle that also attaches now to the underside of the pubic bone. And its use is when you contract that, it, it swings your leg inwards. Yeah. And that swinging inwards is, the, is what, um, I guess it gets torn or something if you're 
if you're doing like the splits, you know, like the soccer players or the, the hockey you, goalie. You, you got this uh, torsion on, uh, on the symphysis and uh, these uh, cutting sequences of, of your whole pelvis. Yeah, and, uh, and that's the reason why uh, I'm not tired to talk about uh, core stability, core stability, core yeah. stability. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we have a question. Um, let me share this screen really quick, which is what is your surgical strategy if they fail conservative therapy of physical therapy and injections? So what there, I know there's a wide range of surgical options. Dr. Myers uh, is the leader in, in a lot of um, his kind of approach. What does he actually do? He sews the rectus muscle down to yeah, the you, to uh, the... you, you take off uh, a part of the rectus muscle from the pubic bone and you replace it down to the conjoint tendon to the Cooper's ligament and you refix it. And then you stabilize the uh, pelvic floor with, uh, and not the pelvic floor, the inguinal floor with sutures. Uh, and then you have to do a adductor release uh, on the insertion of the adductors. Yeah. And in, in my personal experience, after these complex repairs, you need a minimum of uh, 12 weeks to get back uh, to full training. Yeah. Right. So the rectus muscle is used to provide more stability to a weak inguinal floor. Is that right? Yeah, and and you you change uh, you you change the load on the symphysis. Yeah. Yes. So. But you add it to the inguinal ligament. Yeah. Instead. Okay. So, um, another reason for having a weakened pelvic floor or an inguinal floor is a direct inguinal hernia. Yeah. Which you see more in people of older age, but it can occur in anyone. So we have a question about that is how do you differentiate? What's the relationship between a torn muscle or tendon from its attachment to the pubic bone and the weakness or laxity that you see, let's say from an ing a direct angle hernia, can they coexist? They can coexist, uh, but mostly uh, I've seen this uh, weakness uh, in athletes uh, with a real groin pain, with the typical uh, pain symptoms, which are following the, um, the genital branch to the upper tight and uh, to the scrotum. And when they have load and they feel the pain there, that's typically uh, then a real groin pain. And uh, I say, the more the pain is going down to the adductors or to the symphysis, the more you should do a conservative treatment, the more the pain goes real into the groin area, mm -hmm. then uh, the sooner you have to do the surgery. Yeah, and uh, Gilmore has described uh, this type of injury many years ago. And uh, that's a mild rupture of the uh, posterior wall of the inguinal floor. Yeah. And with mild ruptures there, you get a, a, a you get finally a weakness there, and this weakness made a compression to the nerve when you bring load on your uh, abdominal wall. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's very uh, very complicated anatomy. Um, we talk, you talked about how hip pain can cause uh, some groin pain. In a patient with a sports hernia and a hip labral tear, how do you distinguish their symptoms? And let's say they have both, which I've seen. Um, how do you pri prioritize their treatment? Do you do the hip first and then the labral tear or, the, or, or and then their sports hernia or vice versa? Uh, my preferred approach is uh, to do the hip treatment at first mm -hmm. and uh, followed by possibly the hernia treatment. But uh, I've learned the most of the pain is coming from the hip. And yes. uh, when the hip is fixed, uh, when 
when they had their hip arthroscopy, uh, sometimes there is no need for another surgery. Yeah. Yes, I agree because I, I think if the hip is clearly the more symptomatic, then that's a, that's a better repair to get done and addressed. And then you reassess, they may or may not have any more hernia related pain. The hernia may just be what we call a red herring, not necessarily the primary problem. But if they have, let's say, let's say they need a hip replacement. So to, not a labral tear, clearly they have bad bones and they need a hip replacement and they have a hernia. I often fix the hernia first and then have them do their hip replacement later because all the physical therapy that's associated with recovery can then be done without them kind of being hindered by the, the hernia. What do you think about that? Yeah, in, in, in this case, when they have a real arthrosis in, in the hip and need a hip replacement, then I do the hernia first. Yeah, yeah. So another way of treating sports hernia that's in the literature is laparoscopic and also the use of mesh. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, <laughs> that's good uh, because I had a lot of discussions with, <laughs> with my colleagues who are doing the laparoscopic approaches. So um, I'm personally not a friend of uh, these laparoscopic approaches. Um, because I think uh, there is in, in the most of the young, healthy athletes with wonderful muscles, with wonderful tissue, there is no need mm -hmm. uh, to, to place a mesh in uh, really young patients. Yeah? And uh, yeah. in, in these cases, it works. You can stabilize the floor. And uh, when you're in the hands of uh, experienced surgeons, uh, they will have good results with that as well. And uh, I think, uh, and I think we will talk later about that uh, topic when we are coming to the tissue repairs. Yeah. Um, because uh, in the last years, in my opinion, there was uh, too much battle between mesh and non-mesh repairs yeah and yes. we doesn't talk about tailored approach about listening to the patients uh, what is the uh, uh, need of the patient what wants the patient for himself and yeah. uh, we have to find the con um, uh, consent with uh, informed consent with with our patients to find the best way uh, for the patient and for the surgeon. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, I think um, it's the same with laparoscopic or open approach uh, for hernias, for sports hernias, whatever. Uh, I think the battle should not be uh, laparoscopic open. Uh, the, the battle should be how careful we are, uh, how skilled we are, how trained we are. And uh, when you're in the hands of a well-trained laparoscopic surgeon, you will get good results. Yeah. When you're in the hands of, the well, of a well-skilled open surgeon, you will have good results. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, finally, we have to talk about complication risks in especially not so experienced hands. Yeah? And yes, agreed. And, uh, but that's a topic we can talk later uh, about. And, uh, but I think uh, for, for the sports hernia, in my personal opinion and in my personal experience, uh, an open repair without mesh is less invasive than a laparoscopic repair with a mesh placement, especially in high performance athletes. <clears throat> because we know sometimes uh, the meshes are shrinking, the meshes are fixed to the muscles. And uh, when in high performance athletes, the, the muscles are not really good sliding against the fascias and uh, then you can get other trouble. But that's my personal opinion. I know there are different opinions about these topics. Is there any truth to using mesh? It says that it can mesh posteriorly actually offload any tension off of the bone? 
I'm not really convinced about that. Yeah, okay, yeah. It seemed a little weird discussion, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, last question on the sports hernias and then we'll move on to uh, women's hernias and tissue repairs. Um, so this is a 70 year old male. He's had two previous direct angle hernia repairs uh, 20 and 40 years ago. Then he injured his groin three years ago and had another injury two years ago during physical therapy. So he says he has persistent severe pain over his pubic bone that radiates upward, maybe along the rectus, I don't know. I'm contemplating undergoing pelvic floor repair and adductor release, but I am not a muscular athlete and I'm concerned about the risk of dehiscence, which means not healing and it falling apart. What are your thoughts? I think uh, that's not a surgery for a 70 uh, years old uh, patient. Uh, it doesn't matter how active he is or not, but uh, uh, this is surgery for high selected cases in uh, high performance athletes. Yeah? Yes. And, uh, I think uh, when I see this, uh, I would recommend ultrasound and um, uh, MRI with Valsalva mm -hmm. to see if there is not a recurrent hernia, which mm -hmm. uh, uh, it could be that's more a recurrent hernia and uh, not uh, this problem we, we see in high performance athletes. I 100% agree with you. I actually know this patient. That's what my diagnosis, but I 100% agree with you. I think he just needs a recurrent hernia repair. Yeah. Um, yeah. The chances that this is a this that he needs some type of sports hernia type tissue release just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. So, can you please tell us a little bit about your practice? As you know, I'm very interested in women's hernias as part of uh, what I enjoy. We do do a lot of research on it. And um, my belief is that the female pelvis is different than the male pelvis. And we all know anatomically it's different. It's been shown to have more, more nerve um, innervation in the pelvis in women than in men. The shape is different. Um, the organs that are in the area are different. And so, and we have different hormones. So based on that, my personal issue is that Every hernia repair we do is exactly the same for men and women. The technique, there's no gender-based technique. And the mesh that we use is exactly the same size and the same everything for men versus women. And I feel that it needs to be tailored. I feel that women should not get as much open mesh repairs as maybe men can tolerate. Um, laparoscopy works very well for women. And um, I do more open tissue repairs on women than, uh, than I would for, for the typical male. So what are your thoughts on that? And how do you tailor your care? Because I know you treat a lot of females as well. Yeah. Uh, as you know, I had a lot of battles with the European Hernia Society when they presented their guidelines. Uh, yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. About, uh, uh, about the women. And the recommendation uh, and the guidelines of the European Hernia Society or no, the international guidelines, the world guidelines or whatever, yeah, the world is not big enough yes. for that. <laughs> and, yes, yes, uh, I agree. <laughs> they have written that every woman should be operated laparoscopically with mesh implant. Yeah, and I am completely yes. disagree with that. When we are doing that... Agreed. Uh, when we do that, then uh, we don't need any diagnostics. And uh, they said, yeah, we, we can prevent ephemeral hernia. Uh, but for that, we have to know in all statistics, uh, in women, we have more than 60%, between 60 and 70% of the inguinal hernias in women are indirect hernias, not femoral. Just like, femoral, correct. The, the femoral hernias are 15%. Yes. And 
we have to search for these 15 percent and uh, to find the right approach to the hernia when we yeah. have a true inguinal hernia uh, indirect hernia in my personal experience and opinion uh, marcy repair it's enough it's a simple marcy repair a simple suture repair uh, to tight the internal ring, yes. uh, replace the hernia sac, and that's it. It's that's a it's a minimal approach. It's easy surgery, and uh, the women uh, have no risk of pain. Uh, you are not able to touch any nerves there. You should be a bit careful with the genital branch when you do the stitches on the internal ring. But that's yes. it, yeah. And especially in young, healthy women with a complete stable uh, floor, there there's no direct hernia. Why should I open the transversalis fascia? Yes. The only thing we have to do is to search for the femoral hernia. Yeah. And uh, uh, what I do very often, I open the hernia sac. I go with the finger inside to explore the femoral canal to see there is no femoral hernia at, uh, for the final decision for the treatment. And if there is a femoral hernia, then we can shift to a McVay repair or we can shift to a preperitoneal mesh repair. That's possible. Intraoperatively, we can change. But when we do it laparoscopically, the way is mesh repair. And uh, uh, the guidelines are based on the Scandinavian papers where they had uh, a lot of uh, ephemeral recurrences within the first year after surgery. Right. And these are not real recurrences. These are overlooked primary femoral hernias. Yeah. And then we have to know that in Scandinavia, at that time when they made these studies, uh, they did Liechtenstein repairs, Liechtenstein mm. repairs in, in women. And in my personal opinion, uh, there's no indication except very rare cases where we have to tailor to it. But in 99%, there's no indication for an open mesh repair for Liechtenstein repair in women. I agree, yeah. 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 Women are completely different. Step one, exclude the femoral hernia in your pre-op diagnostics. If there is a femoral hernia, do a laparoscopic approach with a mesh placement. If it is a really small uh, femoral hernia, you can do a McVeigh repair. It's easy to do. And for the indirect hernia, especially in young women, uh, I prefer a Marcy repair. Yeah. This is why I love talking to you because I feel like I, I agree 100% with everything you say. 100%, not even 99.9. .9. You <laughs> say exactly what I do and what I experience. And at the same time, what you're saying and what I practice is not current practice. Yeah, I know. It's not even in the guidelines. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, regarding to the guidelines. And uh, on the other hand, and I think you have the same experience. Uh, uh, I see a lot of patients with mesh complications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, the, when I, the, my first question to the patient is, the first question is, was there a change in the pain pre and post-op? Correct. When they have the same pain postoperatively, it was not the right indication. Then we have to search for the reason of the pain. And it's in, not the hernia, opinion, correct. And in my opinion, in these cases, the last step should be to explant the mesh because explanting a mesh is not a nice surgery. That's sometimes it could be horrible. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so. We, we should be very careful with the indication for mesh explants. And the second thing is when, when you ask the patients, so that's my personal experience, how was your hernia preoperatively? Oh, there was 
a minimum bulge close to nothing mm -hmm. and, and I never had a patient with uh, with mesh related pain uh, who said yeah preoperatively I had such a hernia yeah? <laughs> right. never yeah. had such a patient yeah? right yeah and mostly women small hernias uh, and the female gender is a risk factor for developing chronic pain uh, after hernia surgery. We know that. Yeah? Uh, more than 50% yeah. of the pain patients are females, but yes. only 10%, 5 to 10% of all inguinal hernia patients are females. Yeah? And that's why I'm so passionate about it, because I'd like to change those numbers and, like you, try to educate other surgeons that women should be treated differently. They should yeah. be tailored. They should not have as many open mesh repairs. Laparoscopic seems to be better with mesh and then open tissue repairs. We have a lot of questions. Can I go through some of these questions for you? Yeah. Okay, so this is a 58 year old female. She had a, a laparoscopic right and then a lap, that makes no sense. She had a left and a right angle hernia repair. She says it's laparoscopic, but usually laparoscopic, we do both sides at the same time. So since you had two hernias within three weeks of each other, I'm going to assume these were done open. Now she has pain. Um, it hurts when the seatbelt is over her. She's wondering if she should have her mesh removed. She's very skeptical, um, but feels like uh, I'll be back at work in two weeks and should be riding and pushing a bike again in six weeks and none of those have happened. So she's wondering why, uh, I'm going to assume these are open left and then open right laparoscopic repairs. Okay, she's saying it's definitely laparoscopic. So you had a belly button incision or are there incisions in the groin? Because some people mistake um, those, but let's go through both. If it was a laparoscopic repair, on the left side and then the right side three weeks later, and she's now unable to walk or bicycle ride. What's the next step for you in that? Uh, the, the first question is, uh, w when does the pain comes? When, when she had, doesn't had pain before the surgery, then I think uh, there should be something wrong with the mesh placement or yeah. the meshes in, in, in that case, when the pain starts immediately post-surgical, uh, post-surgery, then I wouldn't wait too long uh, for the mesh explant. Yeah. Yes, her surgery was in April. So laparoscopic repair in general has the easiest recovery. So if you're not recovering well from a laparoscopic surgery and you had it in April, it's currently January of the following year, then I would do imaging to see where the mesh is. If it's folded, yeah. um, that's usually the most biggest problem is that the space for the mesh is not adequate and the mesh is folded. And then also sometimes it's that you're a really thin patient and they put a very heavyweight mesh. And that can also sometimes give um, problems with mobility. Sometimes they're using spiral, uh, spiral techers yeah. Yes, that's and, true. Some tackers can also um, cause problems. Talking about a male, so males have a little bit more uh, uh, options um, that are viable, including the open mesh based repair, tissue repair, and laparoscopic repair. So the question is um, for a, a small indirect inguinal hernia in a male, and they want an open tissue repair. Do you have a preference, Bassini, Shouldice, McVeigh? Does it matter? Desarda? Do you do you think it's based on the surgeon and not the technique? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, and uh, I think uh, in, in my personal experience, uh, I'm not doing Bassini repairs. Uh, only in very very rare cases, but the difference between uh, Bassini and Shouldice is not so big. And uh, okay. the, the, the shoulder is repair, you have to open up the whole inguinal floor, including splitting the transversalis fascia. Yeah. And uh, my preferred technique is the shoulder technique. 
yeah uh, with mm -hmm. some modifications and we have just accepted a, a paper in hernia uh, about uh, some possible uh, modifications in in the shoulders repair compared to the original shoulders in toronto uh, i'm not using stainless steel i'm using uh, normally two row the first two rows i'm doing with uh, permanent sutures uh, running sutures and uh, the third and the fourth uh, suture row i do with pds with long-term resolvable uh, okay. stitches and uh, that's my preferred technique uh, but sometimes i'm tailoring interoperatively so mm -hmm. uh, i do the mushovec repair the minimal repair which is a modified shoulders repair mm -hmm. i do especially in young uh, men uh, young males uh, with a stable uh, inguinal floor, then uh, you split only a part of uh, the transversalis fascia and then you're doing this minimal repair. Mm -hmm. Or in uh, some cases, I do the disorder repair as well. But for, okay. uh, for the disorder repair, and it could be that <laughs> there is a big difference between India and uh, the European countries or the United States, because you need a very uh, good external aponeurosis. And uh, yes. what, we, what we see when we do the operations on our patients uh, in the middle of Europe, or I think in the United States, it's the same. Uh, they are not so thin like yeah. the Indians. And uh, sometimes you have a really weak external aponeurosis and uh, with this weak external aponeurosis, it doesn't make sense to yeah. repair. We're thinner. They're, in India, they're thinner. Uh, yeah. we're, we're fatter and we have more wrinkles. Yeah. Maybe that's <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, here's yeah. another interesting question. This lady had... Um, Open inguinal hernia repair on both sides, Trabuco method. And that was back in 2006. Then uh, she felt some pain in her groin in 2019, and she's had nausea ever since. What do you think the nausea can be from? Could it be related to her groin? Oh. <laughs> Uh, it could be related to the groin if there is incarceration of uh, yes. of the a small bowl, but normally if there is no incarceration, the nausea normally doesn't come from uh, from the groin. I think so. But I have seen in people with really small hernias, occult inguinal hernias, or any pelvic pain, they get nausea and sometimes bloating. And I've never been able to explain it why, because there's no intestine involved. But what I've read is that pelvic pain in general, especially in women, can manifest, the pain manifests as nausea. So I would, for that patient, I would double check that you haven't recurred your yes. hernia. Okay, another one, uh, 78 years old, she's a female, open left inguinal hernia pair with mesh six years ago, terrible pain. And then she had the mesh removed and he put new mesh in saying that the original mesh was attached to a nerve. So she continues to have pain and she has a CT scan which shows that the mesh has migrated over a new suprapubic hernia. So I'll just, I'll just explain uh, for people that are looking to have their mesh removed, please make sure it's done for the right indication and by surgeons that do it for a living because there's a lot of thought process and imaging and injections and physical exam findings are very subtle that guide you as to what the right decision is and just willy nilly taking out mesh and oh we'll just cut some nerves no problem that is not <laughs> right i don't think you're helping the patient necessarily often there's a lot of discussion about removing mesh will make you worse. That's actually not true. If it's indicated, it will cure you of, of your symptoms potentially. Yeah. But if you're just going to a surgeon that's doing it because you're asking for it, 
then you may actually be harmed. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's uh, uh, completely my my personal approach uh, because uh, we, as surgeons who are experienced in uh, in these mesh explants, we yeah. have learned our lessons over years. Yeah, and uh, we all right. have our worst cases. Yeah, and uh, where where we were thinking that we are helpful with uh, uh, with a mesh explant and uh, some patients are getting worse after mesh explant. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, we have learned our lessons about indication, about physical examination, about listening to the patient, uh, what's the characteristics of the pain and uh, and sometimes you, you, you have to create a feeling in the discussion with, uh, with the patient uh, to, yes. to move on the right uh, way. And uh, sometimes you couldn't explain why, why you say, okay, I do it now uh, and uh, I don't do it. Yeah? And uh, mm -hmm. when I started with the mesh explants, I was one of the first here in Europe uh, who has really done numbers of mesh explants and yes. uh, I, I was falling on my nose in these <laughs> cases where I let me push to the explant. Yeah. Yes. When, when you as a surgeon are not really convinced about it and the, the patient pushes you and says, yeah, I want to get it removed. And, and in these cases, uh, I'm always saying to the patients, we are able to re remove every mesh. Yeah, But uh, I can't promise uh, that it would be really helpful in your case. Yeah. And what I have learned is... Uh, the most success I had uh, removing uh, open placed meshes, Liechtenstein meshes, yeah. Uh, very successful are mesh explants uh, after laparoscopic repairs when they are using really heavyweight meshes which are folded or yes. tackered. Uh, you, you can be very uh, helpful in explanting uh, plugs. Uh, yes, plugs. the mesh plug. Those are very good. Yeah, when you remove uh, it. Yeah. Uh, the the most of the patients with uh, mesh related pain after plug implant are completely cured. Yes. After implant the uh, plug, and uh, I try to reconstruct the floor whenever it's possible without a new permanent mesh. Yes. And uh, in some cases, I'm using the phasix mesh to get a better reinforcement. Uh, mm -hmm. then I place the mesh. Absorbable, uh, absorbable mesh, uh, yeah. The preperitoneal space. I do a modified shoulder ice repair on top, and uh, the, uh, this phasix mesh induces a better, stronger scar tissue, a bit inflammation there, and uh, yeah. These are my so we have a patient from Sweden, and in Sweden, this patient's doctors have told them that shoulder ice hernia repair is not for women and that women should be repaired with mesh. Have you heard that? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a discussion that's a discussion out of these guidelines. Yeah, they right. uh, yeah the, laparoscopic the with mesh only for women. Yeah, yeah mesh only for women preperitoneal yeah, mesh. We both, uh, we both disagree. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, we both so disagree with that. If, if she has a femoral hernia, then the surgeon is right. If she don't yes. have a femoral hernia, mm -hmm. then yes. you can do a shoulder repair, a McVay repair, a Massey repair, or yes. a laparoscopic repair. But I would recommend never do a Liechtenstein repair in a primary inguinal hernia in women. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I tell them, I have a lot of patients that say they only want tissue repair. I said, that's fine. Let me make sure you don't have a femoral hernia. 
yep. and then uh, that would be a good option. Do you know of any surgeons in Australia that would be open to or have any experience with mesh removal? In Australia, I think John Garvey. John Garvey in Sydney. Yeah, John Gary, but yeah, I think in general, the Australian surgeons don't do as much and they're not as comfortable um, doing them, but if it would be anyone, it would be um, John Gary, yeah. Okay, we have a 45 year old male who's a runner and he's asking, do you still recommend mesh as lots of people are complaining about it? I'm down for, I'm scheduled for a laparoscopic mesh hernia repair next week. I assume this is inguinal. Um, what do you think about that? When it's an experienced uh, laparoscopic surgeon, I think he will get good results as well. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. It's very much uh, experience based. And I think for a runner or an athlete, in fact, laparoscopy is a very good option because it's a very quick recovery. Um, you can tailor the type of repair to the, the weight of mesh. Uh, you don't have to use any tackers. There's no cutting and sewing in the area. So the recovery and the long-term results are pretty good with uh, laparoscopic repair. And actually for men, tell me if you agree with this, the chronic pain rate of open versus laparoscopic mesh, it's a better, less chronic pain with laparoscopic repair. Do you agree? Uh, in mesh repairs, yes. And in the... Yes. <laughs> The pure tissue repairs, I have pain rates in, in my own series below 2%. Yeah. yeah. And someone's saying Professor Lloyd in Australia may be another option. So thank you for, for that um, in Australia. Okay, one last thing I want to comment. I don't know if you saw my paper. So uh, you mentioned that in really small hernias in women, especially in women, you do what's a Marcy repair, which is not a full opening of all the layers and suturing like you do with a shoulder ice, but it's a minimal repair usually done in children where you just close the hole and that's it. And that seems to do okay for women. So I, I see a lot of women with very small hernias and I also felt really bad <laughs> taking a really small hernia hole and then opening up all that muscle to address yeah. a small hole. I'm basically causing a bigger hernia to close a smaller hernia. So based on that, um, I learned about the, uh, I had already known about the Nihus Condon posterior iliopubic tract repair, which I used for like emergencies and incarcerated bowel, et cetera. And so with the robotic technology, since you can sew posteriorly, I then started offering the iliopubic tract repair robotically. So it's basically you're closing the hole, uh, but you're not filleting anything open. And in, in thin patients, so they can't be obese uh, or even uh, yeah, basically BMI less than 30, they do great. And long-term results were great and um, very little chronic pain issues. They all had basically no pain. The nerve is in the way, the general femoral nerve, you have to be careful. But it's a great way to treat bilateral hernias. And if you need a non-tissue repair that you want to do it laparoscopically or robotically, it's a good option. And for sure, not for everyone, but I think uh, the, we call it RIPT, R-I-P-T, Robotic Iliopubic Tract Repair. But- yes, you No, know, I was the reviewer of your paper for hernia. <laughs> I know, I know. So you're a fan. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an amazing technique uh, but uh, and that's uh, what we are talking about the whole hour now uh, it's we have to tailor our approach yeah there, there's no yeah. one food fits all and uh, it was amazing uh, when when the first randomized trial was published in 1998 uh, Liechtenstein uh, versus Schuldeis repair yes. for inguinal hernias uh, from McGilligardy. And there was a comment by Nihus and he yes. has written the biggest mistake in your paper is your one suit fits all approach. Yeah, the recommendation yes. we have to use a mesh now in every patient. Yeah. yeah. And uh, with that uh, 
kind of approach we are training a new generation of haberdashery surgeons yeah yes. and yes. Uh, uh, sometimes we have to read the papers until the end and he was talking about that in 1998 when everybody follows this discussion we never had the discussion we have now uh, with yes. the guidelines and not the guidelines i think tailoring our approach to the patient. There are some different options with mesh, without mesh, robotically, laparoscopically, open, classic, and there is a place for everything. And yes. we have to find the informed consent for our patients. And in my practice, I do more than 80% of all hernia surgery Inguinal hernia surgery yes. uh, without meshes. Yeah, but it was a process. Wow. And yeah. uh, and I'm not against meshes. I'm for meshes on the right place. Yes, I agree. The right indication. Yeah, and we have more to talk about uh, training, about skills, and uh, not about mesh or not mesh. Yeah, or yeah. open or laparoscopically. And yeah. uh, finally, and I think you, you, uh, you have the same experience. The most of the mesh explants we do, uh, the reason for the pain is not the mesh itself. It's folded, it's not tackered on the right place. And, and in, in many cases, the placement of the mesh, the, the technique was the problem. Technique. Yes, it's the technique and the decision making. The skill. Yeah, I totally agree. That hour went by really quickly, but I, I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Sharon. I know it's late. It's late for you, so I appreciate the time. I think it's 10 p.m. right now at your, your home, no? Yeah. So thank you very much for lending your time, your free time. I hope that uh, Germany opens up during this pandemic. We're pretty much shut down in Los Angeles too. So thank you to everyone also for participating. Um, we got a lot of great feedback from our audience and I will make sure that I share the link to this uh, on my YouTube channel so you can watch it again and share it with those of you who think um, you would be able to uh, in, enjoy and, and learn from it. Thank you for your time. I hope to see you soon. Yeah. Um, please take care. You. Please take care. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. And for all of you, thank you for joining us. Come back next week where we'll be joined by another great guest. And I look forward to um, another Hurry Talk Tuesday. Take care, everyone.